Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I, I can't see you, but I hope you're all there. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. We have uh, a number of people with us. Uh, we've got officers Nick Simmons, Grace Grant, Samantha Grant, and uh, Councillor Sarah Warren. Uh, I'm Councillor Matt McCabe. Uh, I'm going to be chairing. Um, we have one hour uh, for this, and uh, we'll get through as many questions as we can. I think, Nick, you've got a short presentation. Uh, so I'll just hand over to Sarah for uh, a few opening remarks. Uh, thanks, Matt. So, uh, yes, I'm a cabinet lead for climate emergency and sustainable transport. And I just really wanted to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar, um, which introduces our journey to net zero plan. So, as you probably know, a climate emergency was declared um, in Bath and North East Somerset back in um, March 2019. But in fact, we also know we've got um, air pollution problems for which we brought in a clean air zone last year. And um, we've got public health challenges. Um, and we know that 29% of carbon emissions in Bath and North East Somerset come from transport. And that in order to hit net zero by 2030, which is our objective, we need to reduce passenger mileage by 25%. So our journey to net zero plan outlines the vision for how we can reduce our carbon emissions in line with our climate emergency. So with that as a summary, um, I'll just uh, hand on to Nick, who's going to tell us all about it. Thank you very much. Yes, I've just got a short presentation, everyone. So I'll, uh, I'll bring that up now and, and share my screen. So hopefully you can see those slides very shortly. Hopefully you can see those. Can I, can I just jump in and say what I forgot to say was, uh, if you've got questions, can you enter them into the question and answer function? The chat function has been turned off. Uh, I, I can see all your questions. And then uh, if we don't get through them all, uh, we can capture those uh, afterwards. But ask any questions as Nick goes. Thank you very much. So, yes, uh, thank you, everyone. And, and uh, thank you for joining us to discuss our latest transport plan, the journey to net zero. Um, so within the plan, we've uh, set out those policies and transport schemes that we're looking to pursue to deliver more sustainable transport options for those people traveling in and around Bath up to 2030. Uh, whilst the plan primarily focuses on Bath, uh, it, it recognizes the importance of travel corridors between the city and the wider district. And this is especially important given that we know that around three quarters of people driving uh, to work in Bath do so from outside of the city. So transport currently accounts for almost a third of our district's carbon emissions and is therefore an important part of our efforts, efforts to become carbon neutral by 2030 in line with our climate emergency. Uh, and we need to act fast, as you uh, appreciate, to reduce transport emissions in our area. And we aim to do this through providing more transport options that will create a, a huge shift to public transport, walking and travel by bike. Uh, the journey to net zero uh, has evolved from the Transport Delivery Action Plan for Bath, which was consulted on last year. And this gave people an opportunity to provide feedback on the importance of a range of transport options. Uh, the consultation results informed our initial thinking for the development of the journey to net zero plan. Uh, it's important to note that as a council, our priorities are set by the administration through the corporate strategy. Uh, the corporate strategy is the key strategic planning document that sets out what work it is we're going to be doing and what's necessary and what, all, oh, sorry, what outcomes we're looking to achieve from those. Um, so our corporate strategy has two core policy themes, which include uh, tackling the climate emergency, but also giving people a bigger say. Uh, this is particularly important when we start to consider and understand the links to the transport agenda. Uh, through to public health, physical activity and uh, air quality. Uh, the journey to net zero itself is an important piece of the jigsaw as it helps support the delivery of these policies by setting out a plan to reduce the environmental impact of, of transport in and around Bath. Uh, the plan is underpinned by our existing strategies, so including, for example, the Getting Around Bath Transport Strategy, which was adopted in 2014, uh, as well as the joint local transport plan, as well as the guidance from central government. So that includes uh, recent documents such as the transport decarbonisation plan, uh, gear change, which is, is about cycling, and, and LTN 120, which is a guidance on, on cycling provision, 
as well as uh, the national bus strategy, Bus Pack Better. Uh, the, drive the, the driver behind all of these, uh, both locally and nationally, is to increase levels of walking and cycling as well as public transport to help reduce levels of car use. Uh, so the plan considers new ways to provide for the transport needs for all sections of our communities and the journey to net zero will become the overarching document that sets out how we will deliver sustainable transport into and around Bath and shape the transport system for the next eight years. Uh, the vision for the journey to net zero plan builds upon the vision included within the getting around Bath transport strategy with some key changes. So we, we, we try to better reflect the importance that we're now placing on our need to reduce carbon emissions uh, from our transport system in line with our climate emergency. Uh, as well as these, uh, as with the vision, the objectives have also been taken from the getting around Bath transport strategy. But again, these have been updated to prioritize the need to reduce carbon emissions and improve uh, air quality and health. It's important to mention as well uh, that the plan has been informed by the findings contained in the Transport Delivery Action Plan, which forms the evidence base for the policies and schemes contained in the plan, as mentioned previously. So again, as, as mentioned earlier, the journey to net zero uh, has evolved from the Transport Delivery Action Plan for Bath, which was consulted on uh, at the start of last year. Uh, the consult consultation included a questionnaire that sought to gauge people's strengths of feeling around a number of high level transport themes, including better bus services, supporting cyclists, fewer HGVs and, and more sustainable school travel, uh, as well as a number of high level uh, themes. We also asked people's views on more detailed concepts within each of those themes. So, for example, uh, for public transport, we asked about dedicated bus lanes, better bus coordination, um, more frequent bus services and cleaner fuel for buses. Uh, as well as the questionnaire, we also held a number of stakeholder meetings, uh, as well as a public webinar similar to this, to gather as many views as possible. Uh, so we had a really good response to that first consultation with, with just under a thousand people responding to the questionnaire. Uh, the graph here shows which of those transport themes were identified most important to people. Uh, and as you can see from, from this, the most important theme was improvements to public transport options. So this included concepts such as upgrading our existing park and ride sites to in, interchange hubs, uh, providing local transport hubs in, in key locations around Bath, as well as things like universal ticketing. Uh, after this, the next best supported themes included supporting cyclists through more dedicated cycle lanes, as well as uh, more secure parking, cycle parking, uh, then better bus services and improvements to pedestrian and blue badge access. In terms of the more detailed concepts, the five concepts uh, thought to be the most important by res uh, respondents uh, included cleaner bus travel, uh, encouraging sustainable travel to school, reducing road freight into the city centre, uh, better support for school journeys on public transport and to make improvements to the pedestrian experience. As well as just asking a number of set of questions, we also gave people uh, an opportunity with the questionnaire to provide us with feedback on anything else regarding transport in and around Bath. So uh, having analysed the comments received, we produced this word cloud uh, that shows the most frequently mentioned words in those responses. And from this, you can see that some of the most frequently used words included things like uh, people, cycling, uh, traffic, bus, road and car. Uh, so those are some of the, the main uh, words that were included in those open text responses that we go, we came back and that was just use, use, useful to see what, uh, what people emphasise in their responses to us. Um, the journey to net zero seeks to cover everything we're looking to do to achieve uh, in transport terms between now and 2030. So consequently, it, it includes everything we are in the process of delivering as well as those future schemes uh, we also want to put in place. Uh, as a result, the schemes have been included in the scheme have been divided into three separate categories, and these include uh, current projects, uh, which are those projects that are already underway or have been delivered recently. Uh, these projects have already been consulted on as well. Uh, we've then also got developing projects, uh, which are those projects uh, under development and are subject to consultation and approval, hopefully in the near future. 
And lastly, we've got our future projects, which include our emerging projects that are not currently being developed and haven't yet been consulted upon. Uh, each of the transport schemes included in the, the journey to net zero fall into one of these three categories. Uh, but it's important to note that with this consultation, we're seeking views on the future projects uh, that have been put forward. We're not looking for, for comments on those schemes we're already developing or, or in the process of delivering. Uh, so the next few slides will run through e each of the themes in turn and the schemes included within each of those. And we'll just run through those quickly. Uh, so the first of the themes is better public transport options, which includes upgrading existing park and ride sites to multimodal interchanges with more transport options available, uh, improved signage to our park and ride sites and direct buses from these two key destinations across the city, including the hospital and the university. Um, it also includes the potential for a new mass transit system within Bath that could link up to a regional mass transit system that would link to ba link Bath to Bristol, sorry. Um, also included, however, improvements to bus stops and bus shelters, which is important, as well as uh, mobility hubs across the city and universal ticketing that would allow users to buy one ticket for their whole journey. Uh, we then move on to journeys on bike and on foot. Uh, schemes included within this theme include new and improved cycle routes that create a network of routes as opposed to the, the limited cycle network that currently exists. Uh, it also includes more segregated cycle routes that separate people on bike and scooters away from the traffic, hopefully making it feel much safer to scoot and cycle. Uh, we also want to provide much more uh, secure covered cycle parking and allow people to have much easier access to a bike through sharing and leasing bikes and e-bikes. Um, as well as this, we want to deliver improvements to the pedestrian environment and make it easier for disabled people to move around the city freely. Uh, as well as this, we will be looking at, so uh, we'll be looking at best examples and technologies that other cities have successfully put in place and seeing whether we can adopt these in Bath. Um, pedestrian improvements include uh, items such as better crossings, wider pavements, uh, improvements to our public spaces and better information and, and route planning. Moving on, then we turn to uh, improved places to live and work. Uh, this theme has got the most potential schemes, including uh, things such as the reallocation of road space in favour of those on foot and on bike. So this includes a long term scheme to adapt a, a traffic cell approach that would change the way in which the city centre is accessed by vehicles, by essentially dividing it into a number of segments uh, and, and vehicle access to each segment would be limited limited to either one or two locations on the outer boundary and vehicles then would be prevented from moving directly from one segment to another. Uh, people traveling on foot by bike or, or on public transport however would be able to move freely across the city as they do now. Uh, this approach has been successfully adopted in other cities and has result in, resulted in a lot less traffic entering their city centre. Uh, so other schemes in Oh, so other schemes within this package however, also includes uh, the next generation of livable neighbourhoods, uh, a new freight package that would see the introduction of freight consolidation and greater use of e-cargo bikes and measures to reduce the overall level of demand for car travel in Bath. Uh, next we turn to school travel um, and the need to put in measures to allow children to travel to school on their own, so travel independently. Um, so measures here would include uh, ensuring we provide better walking and cycling routes with good crossing facilities. Uh, it also means providing more secure, well-lit covered cycle parking, as well as measures to reduce traffic speeds and, and create a safer environment for children to travel to school. Uh, moving on to our next theme, we have the adoption of transport technology to help increase levels of travel by sustainable modes. Uh, so this includes putting in place schemes that help people to travel more easily across a variety of different modes, uh, regardless of, of the operator. Oh, sorry. This includes putting in place schemes to help people to travel more easily across uh, all of the different uh, modes we have, including the uh, e-scooters, which we've been trialling, uh, plus also possibly e-cargo bikes within Bath that people could rent uh, rather than having to own their own. And lastly, just our final theme here is, is about connecting, connecting Bath to the rest of North East Somerset and further afield. Um, as we mentioned previously, whilst the journey to net zero is primarily focused on Bath uh, transport, uh, it, it does include a, a host of measures for those travelling into the city from outside 
to ensure that people aren't reliant on having to drive into Bath from outside. Uh, so included within this theme are our corridor studies that look at providing improvements to public transport on those corridors into Bath, including the A367 and the A4, of course. Um, these improvements will provide an affordable and realistic alternative to the car for people living or working in these areas. Um, we also want to look at ways in which people can access the improved public transport on these corridors through improvements to walking and cycling provision. Um, we've also identified, however, the need to develop better off-road cycle facilities that are separated from the traffic to allow people to cycle into Bath as well as providing transport hubs that connect these routes to the bus network. Um, lastly, other measures we are proposing include uh, working hubs to reduce the need to travel into Bath uh, for work, as well as demand responsive bus services for those locations which are too far to walk or cycle to get to the improved uh, bus services on the main corridors. So the, uh, the consultation on the journey to net zero went live on the 10th of January, and we're looking for as many people as possible to give us their views before the consultation closes on the 7th of February. Uh, people can respond to the consultation either online via our website or via a hard copy that can be found at one of our main libraries. Uh, and the feedback will be used to help finalize which schemes we ultimately take forward. So just the last slide here, in terms of uh, our next steps, uh, following this consultation, we will be looking to analyze the comments that we've received back, and we'll be using this to update the report where needed. And once the report has been updated, we'll uh, be looking to gain approval of the plan in May of this year. And once adopted, we can then look to start putting together the business cases needed to fund the changes before putting these in place. I hope that was useful and thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll move on to some questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. I think we thank you, Nick. Okay, so uh, we've got lots of questions have arrived. So uh, Adam uh, kicks off with, how does the council seek to balance green stroke climate issues with the inevitable damage to the tourist economy? Um, I'm not sure uh, that there is inevitable damage, but uh, I'm assuming. Uh, I mean, I'm my my income is entirely uh, dependent on on tourism, and I've already got people turning up uh, with electric vehicles, um, uh, and also people turning up with bikes so that they can cycle around. Um, uh, so, wh where are we in terms of assessing the impacts on the tourist economy? If I could just start with that one, Matt, if that's okay. I, I think it's important to note that in actual fact at the moment, we're probably probably damaging our economy quite significantly with the amount of cars we have in our city centre. We do have a significant number of visitors and tourists say, isn't Bath such a lovely place? But what a shame about the traffic. <laughs> and it's a continual uh, comment we, we always get from, from people visiting. So. Uh, you know, I, I don't see that the changes that we're putting in place actually will have uh, a detrimental impact. Uh, we hope that the improvements we make will make it easier for people to travel around the city. It will be a cleaner city to travel around. It will be a city where people can understand there'll be more information, so there'll be more signposting and wayfinding. Um, so I would hope that it wouldn't, well, we're not expecting it to damage the tourist uh, economy. But it's also important just to mention that as part of this, we will be putting together business cases and those business cases will be looking in detail at the economic impacts of all of these schemes. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, did you want to add to yeah, that? I want to have a go. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that there are um, sort of European cities that have already been down this road ahead of us. Um, so I don't know if you've seen pictures of places like Amsterdam and Copenhagen in the 1970s, um, but they were as heaving with congestion as Bath now is. And I don't think we would say that um, moving to greener forms of transport has damaged their tourist economies. OK, a uh, question from Frank. Um, when will the circulation plan be issued? And I certainly that's uh, one of the things people said, and I think it's another reference to, the, to a circulation plan. It's, it's really hard to assess the, that um, cells, um, historical core cells, when, when you don't know where the, the planned circulation of traffic is going to go. Um, Nick, is there plans to, to publish a circulation plan? Um. 
Yes, yeah, so as, as part of the traffic sales scheme, I, th I think there's a number of points. We're, we're probably going to get a, a, a lot of questions on this tonight. So uh, I think it's important to say that obviously we're at the outset of this in terms of it is a concept at the moment that we've included here and one that we're interested in looking at and one that's been obviously put in place successfully elsewhere. Uh, but as part of this, obviously a lot of work is going to be required in terms of modelling those traffic cells and seeing what the impact is on the wider transport network. Um, so that that modelling needs to be undertaken and, and that will include obviously developing a circulation plan uh, as, as well as developing those other schemes that are going to be required such as livable neighbourhoods uh, and effective livable neighbourhoods as part of the traffic cell scheme. Um, but yes, that will be done as part of those more sort of detailed modelling works as we move forward with the scheme. But this is, as I said, the earliest of the uh, earliest uh, place where in terms of the concept and, and obviously a lot more work is going to be required. And, and a quick follow up from Frank was when will the uh, Liverpool Neighbourhoods Tranche 2 proposals be issued <laughs> or announced? Have we got any plans for a, a second round of Liverpool Neighbourhoods? Uh, the, the plan does include the next generation of livable neighbourhoods. Yes, absolutely. So that is something that we'll be looking at, obviously, as, as part of the package of measures. Um, uh, a question from Jeremy, Jeremy uh, is, is this uh, the reducing the environmental impact of transport in Bath to do with Bath or the world? Uh, and who were the stakeholders that were consulted with? Well, I think uh, we're, we're looking to do our bit by by ensuring that we do the, the least amount of environmental damage uh, when we move around the city uh, as we make the choices of how we travel. But um, uh, the stakeholders that were consulted last time, Nick, is everybody sort of uh, stakeholder groups as well as the public, was it? General public? Yeah, so we, we did hold a number of uh, stakeholder workshops and we split that into a number of categories. Uh, so we, we, we spoke to transport groups, we spoke to environmental groups, uh, we spoke to schools, we spoke to uh, who else? Uh, a whole host. I think we have nine separate meetings. Sorry, Grace, you probably remember better than I do. Sorry. How many do we have? Is it nine? Yeah, it was nine, nine meetings. Um, so sort of business groups, transports um, groups, schools, um, seldom heard groups, environmental groups, um, plus the ones you, you've already covered, Nick. Yeah. Thank you. So a lot of lot of people are fed into this process. Um, uh, Eileen's asking a quick question about why are there some cancellation of bus routes as mentioned in the local paper. Um, Eileen, the, the, the bottom line is the impact of COVID. Um, the government is, is, is funding the, 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 the difference in finances for the, for the bus companies, but that funding runs out at the end of March. Um, we, we met with the minister. Um, there was some confusion, shall I say. Uh, the minister was insistent that first are at 90 percent of uh, passenger numbers, um, therefore, as is most of the country, and therefore it's OK to cut that funding. Uh, whereas first te were telling us that they're only at 70 percent of pre-COVID passenger numbers uh, and first are looking at funding cliff edge at the end of March. So they've they've produced the bus routes that they intended to cancel or the services they intended to halve because they will be looking at a massive drop in funding come the end of March. Um, we've worked with the Wecker Mayor and who has stepped in uh, to uh, try and alleviate some of that damage. Uh, Sarah, did you want to add to that? Yeah, it was just to add, um, because it's, it's often a, a, a misconception, actually, um, is that, you know, uh, just to emphasise that bus companies are entirely private and as a unitary authority, we don't have a direct relationship with them other than, than the personal relationship we have with their chief executive. We don't have a direct contractual relationship with them at all. So um, we have tried to influence through soft means, but that's the only means that we have, really. Okay, question from Rachel. Your vision states that you want to reduce transport in the historic core. The World Heritage Assets and Important Historic Buildings detailed in the UNESCO inscription, uh, inscription extend north of the core, uh, and you have set out in this document uh, uh, and to the east of the Pulteney Estate. Why is your historic core so small? Why isn't the historic core defined by the CAS boundary map? Uh, Nick, um, Yes. How do we how do we go about defining stuff? And do we do we you know, this is does the circulation plan send traffic through the historic core as defined 
like that? Um, you're right. Uh, there have been a number of different maps highlighting exactly what the city centre is. So uh, us in transport planning might define it slightly different to those in planning policy, for example, in our core strategy or placemaking plan. But it's important that uh, we remember that, as, as, as the question said, the whole of the city is a World Heritage Site and, and designated as such. And we will treat it as such. And we will obviously do our absolute utmost to make sure that we treat everyone fairly, whether that be the residential areas surrounding the city centre or the city centre itself. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I, I guess the city centre is, is, is that area where the, the, the primary retail functions are. That, that's what we would call the, the city centre. But you're right, there, there has been a number of definitions and, and that doesn't make it any easier. And it would be something we would look to define clearly, obviously, as part of the, the, the further work, the more detailed work we'd do. As we take some of these ideas forward. Uh, question from Rob is around uh, journeys to school. Uh, he notices that uh, the roads are so much busier at rush hour in term time. Um, uh, and it feels like a joined up way of reducing uh, cars in the school run would have a higher impact. Um, am I missing something about the data here? Or is it too politically tricky? Um, Rob, I think uh, part of the problem was was is the loss of uh, catchment areas. And um, if you go back, you remember that people were buying houses in the catchment areas of schools high up in the in the lists. Uh, so the sort of the government's response to that at the time was to um, move schools out to uh, academies uh, and do away with catchment areas. But in doing away with catchment areas, it makes it very difficult to run a school bus uh, to pick up uh, kids. Now, mine, mine went to Ralph Allen. We, we're very lucky we live on one of the bus routes uh, that's laid on for Ralph Allen. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, certainly myself and Councillor Joel Hurst uh, picked up on was uh, Adam's um, ideas of, of uh, Scholars Way, which is a, a cycle route that links all the secondary schools on the south of Bath, and, and we're very we're off on that journey uh, to create those cycle routes. But um, I just say, looking ahead, what other uh, initiatives uh, are we doing? School streets, Nick. What else have we got planned for? We've got a host of items within the, the journey to net zero, and it's a really important uh, area. Uh, and I think that's reflected by the fact that it has its own chapter within the report. It is absolutely critical. You know, if we're looking to make uh, our travel more sustainable in the future, there's no better way of doing that than starting with school children and ingraining that behaviour from the outset. Um, but in terms of the specifics of the journey to net zero, uh, there's a host of, of, of measures, so sort of high quality walking routes uh, with, with good crossing facilities, uh, reduced traffic speeds, that's so important to, so people have a much better uh, uh, better sense of, of being safe when walking and cycling. Uh, good levels of security and lighting, secure bike storage. Um, so th there's a host there as well as um, you know capacity on our buses and, and making sure that school pupils are able to use public transport in terms of you know providing the knowledge and technology to, to really um, enable that. Um, and we're also looking at you know, bus travel more affordable and, and better coordinated so that the buses are there for when the children need them so that they don't end up turning up late to school because that, that obviously is a big issue as well. So, uh, and obviously school streets as, 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 as well as you mentioned. Sorry. So there's, there's, there's a host of things that we want to try and put in place to try and enable those people to travel to school. Yes, I def definitely want to uh, uh, enable young people to choose uh, active travel. Saskia, I hope that answers your question as well. Are school streets going to be part of this? I know there's one school street requested in the current round of, of livable neighbourhoods. Um, Peter says, what about trams? I think uh, the answer to that is probably where the uh, the Wecker's, Wecker's mass transit study is considered, trams is one of the considerations on that. So if, if trams go ahead, my guess is it, it will be uh, Bristol to Bath on that route initially and i think that will that will maybe dictate what happens after that nick do you sorry just coughing there <laughs> um, yes yeah, so uh the journey to net zero plan as i said is a holistic plan so it covers everything that we're looking at doing uh at, at the moment so obviously there is the regional mass transit scheme which is the sort of bath to bristol leg on on the a4 
but there's also the inclusion of, of potentially looking at, well, the potential for a mass transit system in Bath. Uh, and as part of this study, we will be doing a separate uh, piece of work that looks at mass transit in Bath uh, and what potentially could work best for the city uh, and, and how we might look to, to do that. So we'd look at potential technologies and, and the viability of those in, in a commercial way. I don't, I don't know if I'm missing anything there, Grace or Sam, chip in if there's anything I'm, I'm missing at all, but I think that covers it. I think, yeah, I think that's it's keeping that sort of open mind at this stage in terms of technologies and, and considering some of the kind of constraints um, specific to, to Bath in terms of mass transits at this at this point in time. But as Nick said, a kind of separate, more detailed piece is, is being worked on on that. OK, uh, Lynn is asking, what is the bus back better plan? Um, <laughs> if there was ever a plan, dare I suggest it was a catchy phrase. Um, uh, obviously, the, the main thing to, to be aware of is that, that the local authority is no longer the transport authority when it comes to buses. Uh, so that is now under Wecker. Uh, and far from bus back better, I think what, as I was explaining earlier, what Wecker are trying to do is just save the bus services we've got at the moment. Uh, and until we have a big shift back to bus usage, being run by the private sector, bus bus companies are going to be after profit profitable routes. Sarah, did you want to? Um, yes, it was just to say um, the <clears throat> so um, the West of England Combined Authority. We are working closely with them, and they um, put together something called a bus service improvement plan in the autumn. And uh, I would say we were pushing them hard to um, encourage them to really increase their ambition around um, you know making bus services faster and more direct and more frequent so that people are really um, tempted to um, leave their cars at home and get onto the buses. And um, now there's a period of negotiation uh, whilst the West of England Combined Authority agree something, a new thing called an enhanced partnership with the bus companies that will um, begin again after 40 years or so of not really having any influence. It will mean that the West of England Combined Authority will start to have a bit more contractual influence over the bus services. So once again, and we're looking to be involved in that process and we'll be really pushing the West of England Combined Authority to be very ambitious in what they are looking for out of the bus companies. Thank you. Eileen, you asked a question about cyclists being monitored. I think cycling on the pavements or the wrong way down one-way streets, I think that's already an offence and it's just about police resource. Um, uh, Jeremy asks an interesting question. Why do the current project in the plan uh, not need to be assessed for carbon reduction impact or why are they not assessed for carbon reduction are um are they all i think we we've measured it, it's an interesting point about how we measure these schemes and uh, where how we've measured where we are now sarah do you want to or nick do you want to nick do you want you you un, un, unmuted first nick I'm quite happy to pass the term on this one, but it, it, um, it, it, yeah, well, I'm sorry, you, you, you go ahead first, sorry. By well, I'll means. have a go at some of it, and if I miss things then, or if Nick knows more, he'll contribute. I mean, at the moment, <coughs> as a council, we submit data to the Department for Business, Energy um, and Industrial Strategy, um, BASE, um, on an annual basis, so that's how we know what our carbon emissions are as an authority, and that's how we know that transport is 29, or was a couple of years ago, 29% of the total. Um, uh, so I, I think, I believe that as an authority, we are probably developing processes to actually assess um, projects as they come forward for their carbon emissions impact. But that's a bit of a work in progress because I think as of, you know, many councils declaring climate emergencies a couple of years ago, um, it, it's fairly new area, but Nick may know more or the, um, the consultants may know more. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that does cover it. Um, and, and certainly in terms of those existing current schemes, so, so they're either ones that are in the process of being delivered or have already just recently been delivered. Uh, and, and as part of that, those carbon emissions uh, may have already been assessed as, as part of those. But obviously we need to understand what our uh, future schemes are going to be doing and those ones that we're developing are going to be doing in terms of helping to get us to that, that, that target of being carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, and I do believe, yes, WECA, WECA are developing that tool uh, alongside the, the other unitary authorities, and, and we're taking an active role in that to make sure that we can actually quickly and, and fairly easily, I hope, 
assess the carbon impacts of our future schemes uh, so we can actually really start to make inroads into understanding how close we are to carbon neutrality. Lovely. Uh, Frank says, can you give an assurance that all available active travel funding of, uh, from government via WECA will be taken up and spent, um, bearing in line the lack of officers uh, to prepare the LTN 120 compliance schemes? I think we've got We've got a lot of schemes ready to ready to go, Sarah, haven't we? Uh, we have some schemes ready to go, and we are hoping to really um, staff up after a period um, in which we've been quite affected by austerity and the travel transport team had become quite slim and thin on the ground. We are now staffing back up, and um, we've been fortunate that um, government has put forward um, these large sums of money uh, to help us do that. Okay, uh, Therese, uh, Therese, I hope you feel we've answered the question about trams. Jeremy's again on cycle storage asks in residential areas too. I think we we had asked people to request uh, cycle storage, but you'll be looking at looking at sort of, sort of odd spaces uh, where we could join up odd spaces and uh, and into one space to get some covered cycle storage. But I think. Uh, we will be asking people to request them in their streets and um, you can lose one parking space and get sort of enough, sort of a dozen bikes parked under cover. That's anybody want to add to that? No. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, uh, and now, and I also, also, uh, I've just got down to uh, a question uh, that reminded me when I started this there were 35 questions and I now see there's 77 so we're, we're plowing on through uh, we've talked about the cir circulation plan I hope that's okay um, uh, now Saskia asks lots of future projects have got a time scale of medium term to long term in this document which translates to three to ten years would you agree that in order to reach net zero by 2030 most projects will need to be developed on the short to medium term instead uh, Sarah, is it is it just that thing of local authorities have developed an evidence base and then develop the business cases and then find the funding and that is that is three to ten years. Um, I suppose that's it. I would also um, say that if you remember, central government is on a trajectory of twenty fifty, and there are things in life that local government, uh, local authority cannot control and we're on a 2030 trajectory so all you know we will implement as much as we can as fast as we can within the constraints of um our powers and our funding and uh, and you know and our objective is 2030 and our our, our objective of you know our purpose is to hit that in, in so far as possible and this is the first step uh, along the road is to outline our vision, which in turn will allow us to bid for any additional funding uh, and take advantage of any new powers that are offered to us as soon as they become available. Okay, Adam, Leon points out the obvious thing that if we're all being encouraged to uh, switch to electric vehicles um, in order to have a big impact on the emissions in, in the city, uh, not having any uh, Charging points in our car parks or whatever uh, is not going to help the problem. Um, Adam, I can tell you that uh, I was personally looking into this with, with Councillor Alice Singleton over the summer. Uh, and I, I was in workshop meetings with uh, Western Power Distribution um, because one of, one of our issues is every time we ask for uh, charging points, fast charging points to be put in. Western Power have said, no, there's not enough capacity on the grid. Um, so I went along the stakeholder meetings last summer and we are in an unfortunate and highly undesirable situation whereby um, the Western Power distribution are coming to the end of an eight year funding period. Uh, and when they consulted their stakeholders to build the evidence back in 2010, 2011, the need for fast charging of electric vehicles, um, lots of solar panels and uh, uh, heat pumps was not anticipated. And so they didn't put the money in to upgrade the grid. And we have a, a woefully um, uh, under, under uh, capacity grid, very old that needs updating and uh, what 
Western Power were doing last summer was building the evidence that in their next funding period, which begins in 2023, that that's where people want the money spent. And I was there for Baines and there were members from South Gloss, Bristol, North Somerset, um, Somerset, all the Western authorities saying you have got to upgrade the grid so that we can meet our climate emergency um, demand or uh, promises. Uh, so uh, the bad news is that the grid will not be start to be upgraded until 2023 but the good news is that we have sat down with the, the regional director at Western Power uh, who has worked out where they do have capacity and so this year we will be getting in some additional fast charging points because as you say and as I mentioned at the beginning you know when I get a a customer from my holiday cottage who wants uh, who, who, who arrives in an electric vehicle they want a fast charge uh, so that they can basically drive around the next day and trickle charging is is not really up to up to it uh, for residents trickle charging may offer uh, a solution that we can start to work on this year in terms of on street charging so uh, all that's all that's the state of affairs at the moment but we are trying to move forward so i think what we want to see um by the end of this year is some some concrete offers from uh, western power distribution of what what their next funding period is going to deliver and, and then partners to work with to get fast charging onto our streets uh anybody else wanted to add anything to that i don't can't see anybody no uh so jeremy uh, asks a question about the corridor routes so the weka are currently uh looking at corridor studies um uh, and we're looking at corridor routes into the into our city center what again what's our definition of city center i i don't know if there's anything to add to what we said earlier on boundaries nick no, nothing really to add other than you know just to reflect the importance of making sure that we get those radial routes and, and the public transport on those radial routes working as best we possibly can and high frequency turn up and go services and you know that's in line with with what Wecker are proposing through the you know the, the bus service improvement plan yeah um, so they are reviewing those bus services and putting in uh, much quicker much better services uh, on those on those main routes into the cities and including Bath and making sure that people can connect to those routes that is that is the main way forward in terms of providing those mobility hubs and interchanges and and, and allowing people to to walk and cycle to those routes and, and where it's too far to walk and cycle providing demand responsive transport to get to those radial routes to get into our towns and cities without having to feel the need to drive essentially jolly good uh another question about schools i think we covered schools um oh rob is asking um that the vision site some other plans and studies uh in, eg a top of town study how do i find or look these up are they, uh, nick are they on the website they're, they're not at the moment they're a work in progress at the moment so we actually haven't published the top of town or, or, or the mills from quarter but we wanted to make reference to those pieces of work that are in development they're uh, coming up they are coming so watch this space so hopefully you'll find them interesting so uh frank raises the point about uh, vehicle speeding is a major problem 20 mile an hour zones are welcome but do virtually nothing to stop speeding how do you intend to tackle speeding motorists i, I mean in terms of we can, we can install traffic calming but short of lots of cameras everywhere it's very hard isn't it nick it is very hard it is very hard and i think we just it's something we definitely have to get better at doing and, and we need to increase that enforcement and work with the, with the local police and, and make sure that, that enforcement is there it, uh, council one did mention that you know we can do everything that we possibly can within bath and northeast somerset and providing in terms of providing infrastructure and the services and, and making it as affordable to, to to travel by other means other than your car but ultimately there are some things that fall without sorry fall within other people's uh departments and obviously um enforcing traffic speeds isn't isn't one that Baines does but we can work with the police to make sure that we can do as best as good a job as we possibly can um and you know those, those 20 mile an hour speed limits are absolutely key uh, and, and traffic speeds have reduced across the city as a result of those and in, in Canesham as well where we put them in place so they are effective but we need to do more I think Okay, uh, there's a point here from Matt Bird uh, on EV charging. They've recently installed 10 EV charging bays at the podium, uh, but have the scope to increase this. 
uh, expansion is likely to be gradual and demand led. Is there a scheme to incentivize early investment? Um, the go ultra low thing was that uh, does that help if you're making them public? And how is that going? <laughs> So the Go Ultra Low West program, I, th I think, uh, includes 120 charges, I think, from the top of my mind, from, from memory. Um, so obviously that whole program is about providing uh, those electric vehicle charging points. But it's also uh, important to note that, you know, we're working on this as well through uh, our planning documents as well to make sure that electric vehicle charging points are put in place as a result of new developments as well. So we, we are really looking to try and make sure that... Uh, that we do provide for these uh, these charge points as, as they're required and as more and more people start taking up electric vehicles. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's part of the challenge as well as uh, on-street provision, which we've included within the journey to net zero. Uh, and, and, and that's something we'll be looking at. I, I don't know if there's anything I've, I've missed out from there at all in terms of the plan at all, Sam or Brent. I, I, I think uh, in order to qualify for Weka support to install fast charging points, they just have to be publicly available and not just for customers. I think that's the thing. So uh, um, check in, check in with Weka. Um, uh, uh, hi, Fares. Uh, oh, somebody's asking, can speakers speak into the mic and not turn their heads away sideways, please? Um, <laughs> uh, Ellie, um, our, uh, thank you for inviting questions. Our village is hoping to set up a centralised parcel delivery hub to reduce the number of vans crossing the village. Are you aware of any examples we could look to for how to set something up like this? Um, what do we call it? Freight, freight consolidation? Um, how does that how does that work in the city? And do you know of any other villages who are? I don't know of any villages that are doing that. I have to admit, um, it's usually something that's done in towns and cities uh, where there's an issue of HDV uh, vehicles travelling through the city centre to, to to make their deliveries. Um, so essentially, freight consolidation, uh, the, the, the principle behind that is that uh, freight vehicles, large HGV vehicles, actually drop their, their loads off uh, at a location outside of the city centre. And uh, these are then taken on their trip for the last part of their journey, the last mile into the city centre to the business or, or, or the customer who's, whose goods they are. They get taken in either on an electric vehicle or on an e-cargo bike, uh, if, if, if obviously they can fit in an e-cargo bike. Um, so that's how that works. And it then prevents those HGVs actually having to be in the middle of Bath to make those deliveries. Because the vast majority of HGV vehicles in Bath actually do have a reason to be in there. There is a lot of three traffic for HGVs, but the vast majority of HGVs actually have business in Bath. So it would actually help us a lot to, to make sure we can actually prevent those vehicles actually having to get into the city centre. Um, but there's also rail freight as well, which we're looking at. Sorry, Councillor One. That's all right. In terms of the hub in your village, Ellie, um, it, um, if you don't track down other examples um, of other places that are doing this yourself, it sounds a really exciting um, measure. And I would say that the Clean Air Zone team are doing a bit of work on setting up um, e-cargo bike delivery and hubs. So um, do write in to us and we'll connect you with some, somebody who, who is on the way to knowing a bit more. Indeed, I have to say, Ellie, as your ward councillor, I do look to Freshford to be setting the example <laughs> for the rest of the authority to follow. Um, we've had a number of questions again about buses and about the cost of buses. And uh, somebody was just commenting on the the uh, the cost of buses versus the cost of parking. Um, and buses are expensive and, and parking is cheap. Um, that's not necessarily part of this document, is it, Nick, um, in terms of pricing? Um, it, it's not. The vast majority of the policy with regards to, to buses and what we're doing exactly is, is included within that bus service improvement plan from WECA. I think it's important to note that when we talk about buses being expensive, we often compare that to just the cost of a tank of petrol. We don't often think about the additional costs that come with owning a car. So the MOTs, uh, the road tax, the tyres you have to spend. So all of these things you know, do cost. And actually, when you start comparing it, uh, it, it is 
uh, expensive owning a car, but you're right, we need to do more to make public transport cheaper. And the bus service improvement plan is looking at that and includes proposals for lowering fares, uh, making simpler ticketing uh, an, an easy means of payment. Uh, so all of that is included within that bus service improvement plan and that uh, enhanced partnership that uh, WECA are working on. So uh, yes, essentially that is included uh, within the BSIP, which we sort of refer across to in the journey to net zero. Uh, Theresa raises the point that European cities, uh, when, especially when talking about the traffic cells, European cities have ring roads and trams and mass transit. Is there plans for, um, we talked about trams, but that we can't put a ring road in, surely? Or, or there's no, you know, building big roads is not, it's not the way we're going, is it? No, no, no. There are no proposals to start building new roads or ring roads to city traffic. And I appreciate Ghent is a different city because we did draw that comparison to Ghent. It is a different city. It wasn't uh, our intention to draw, draw a direct comparison between the two cities. It's more about what can be achieved if you put certain schemes in place. Uh, but I appreciate that, yes, Ghent has a, a ring road. Bath does not have a ring road. But it's worth mentioned though that obviously as part of the journey to net zero there is a package of measures it's not just about restricting traffic in our city centre it's about making cycling routes better making pedestrian environments better it's about improving buses potentially a mass transit scheme it's about all of these things put together it's about livable neighbourhoods and making it nicer to cycle and walk it's all of these measures putting it together and any schemes that look in terms of the traffic cell is is a longer term scheme and we'd be looking to put everything in place uh, and, and creating a lot more capacity on the roads by removing traffic. So at the moment, 50,000 vehicles or around 50,000 vehicles actually start and end within Bath. I mean, that's a huge number of trips. So we can get those off of the road uh, and, and, and actually people walking and cycling within the city uh, for their trips by making those, those, those modes a lot more attractive. Uh, then obviously that frees up the, the, the road space so the traffic can actually go around the city and not have to travel into it. So, you know, it, it's about a package of measures, I think, is, is probably how I'd, I'd look at that. And on that point, Annie is asking that about the funding. Uh, is, the, is there money to pay for all this? There's some very ambitious plans that I'd love to see implemented, but it'd be very disappointed to discover there was no money for it. We, we're expecting that money will be coming for these sorts of schemes. Is that right? Yes, yeah, uh, certainly in terms of finances, uh, we have got a significant amount of uh, money that we are able to tap into. So following the devolution deal some years back, uh, significant amounts of public funding are now available for transport improvements. Uh, the West of England, it's worth mentioning, has also just recently been awarded £540 million pounds over the next five years for investment in transport improvements through the city region uh, strategic transport settlement. Uh, and. Uh, you know, this level of funding is, is unprecedented and, and will be used to help us to improve our local transport networks for the benefit of everyone. Um, so with funding from that settlement, uh, we can expect, you know, more bus facilities, new walking and cycling routes, better maintained roads, more joined up working between us and, and, and the West of England local authority. So it, it, is, it is exciting times and there is uh, a, a lot of funding available for that. Sarah? Going to add that our portion of that five hundred and forty million pounds um, we'll be discussing at our cabinet meeting um, on Wednesday evening over Zoom, uh, and our portion of that is one hundred and thirty something million pounds, um, which, as Nick says, is unprecedented. But on the other hand, is definitely not enough to do all of this that is in this um, journey to net zero uh, document. Um, so. Uh, there is a paper for the cabinet uh, meeting that defines what we feel can be afforded for that amount of money. But as I said, the process is that we have to outline our vision in this way in order to be able then to bid for any further pots of funding that um, come available. OK, so a uh, question from Andy, who lives in South Down. My partner's recently bought an e-bike and what puts her off most is lacking confidence and feeling unsafe riding in traffic. She'd like some training. Is, is that going to be available uh, and being included in this plan? I, I don't know about training and it's a good point. And certainly, certainly, you know, if, if we're going to enable choice, uh, we need to look at things like that. I mean, it, you know, I have I have a diesel four by four to get on and off the farm. I have a, a, a electric vehicle and an electric bike. 
So if I have to drive into town, I try and always choose the electric vehicle. But most of my travel around town now is on the e-bike. Uh, and it is the choice that I want to make, but it is the choice that comes with the most bruises. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't um, fill you with um, um, joy, uh, the thought of, of heading off into town on your bike. But, you know, it's, it's what you've got to do. And certainly active travel is, is a choice I can make. Uh, so I should make. Um, but uh, I, I haven't I, I think I had some training when I was at school on how to cycle a long long time ago uh, and I haven't had anything since and I just had to get the hang of an e-bike which was a bit scary but uh, I uh, somebody gave, gave me a go on theirs which was the first thing but are we are we planning training or I mean there's e-bike hire isn't there that's part of it there is there's, there's e-bike hire uh, we're also proposing e-bike leasing uh, so people don't actually have to own their own because it's quite an expensive thing to, to, to buy an e-bike. Um, I think it's important to, to mention that we already do provide training for cycling. Uh, so that's for school children and I believe also adults as well that can actually access that and, and that's paid for through DFT funding. Uh, but it, it, it's absolutely important. We can't expect people to cycle if they don't feel safe. And, and we wouldn't ever expect people to. And that's why we are wanting to hand over more of our road space to cycling uh, and, and, and walking, but, but particularly cycling in this instance, uh, to enable them to feel safer on those roads so they're not having to travel in amongst all the traffic, which can be pretty intimidating, especially in a historic city such as Bath, where the streets are quite narrow. You know, so we want to provide those, those safer routes and make people feel that they're safe on their bike. And, and we're only going to actually get people onto their bikes and once that's the case and we appreciate that totally so that's what this plan hopes to do is is to make sure that people feel safe on their, on those bikes and that training is out there and i think it's, uh, there should be links on our on our website for that i don't know if there's anything you want to yeah. add yeah um it's bike ability it's called a bike ability all one word um so if you um put that in the search engine um with uh, bath and northeast somerset you'll bring up the right page Okay, uh, uh, there's questions about livable neighbourhoods. Uh, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left uh, and uh, there's a lot of questions. All of these hopefully have been captured uh, and we will feed those into the consultation. Um, uh, so, but let's say uh, Dave is asking questions. So if, we, if, if Mount Road livable neighbourhood included uh, a school street uh, at Round Hill um, to improve air quality. Uh, how will we uh, address this, the likely displacement of traffic onto Whiteway Road? Um, we we had we had a conversation about Whiteway Road. I mean, I love, live off the bottom of Rush Hill. You know, we we we're getting and uh, we know we're getting traffic off the A36 because we're getting great big HGVs trying to turn right. Uh, at Hinton Charterhouse and then try and get in, getting under the railway bridge in Midford, coming up into Odd Down, Rush Hill, Whiteway, and you're off to Bristol. Uh, so we know we've got a lot of extra traffic on, on Rush Hill, Whiteway, thanks to the Cleveland Bridge closure. And, and, and we fear that that uh, the, uh, the once sat-navs know about these routes, that's it. So there's already a lot of pressure on roads like uh, Whiteway. Uh, so how do we how do we deal with this? And there's been lots of questions about displacement, where you know, especially uh, around uh, if, if you're putting circulation routes in, and uh, so how do you stop displacement into residential areas? Uh, Nick, have we got? We we do talk about the next generation of livable neighbourhoods within the plan. Uh, and other means and, and, and measures that will end up uh, potentially diverting traffic from where they currently travel. I, I think it goes back again to the, that level of detail in terms of we will, as part of this, need to make sure we do a lot of work in terms of modelling the effects of what will happen when we put these measures in place and making sure we put mitigation in that, that, that prevents traffic going where it shouldn't go. You know, is it, we don't want... Uh, the council doesn't want to put traffic on on, on inappropriate routes and, and residential streets where it shouldn't be uh, that's that's not our aim uh, so obviously as i said part of the work for us as we look at this in more detail would be making sure that, that we have that plan 
uh, which clearly shows where the, where we want the traffic to be and where we more importantly don't want it to be. Um, so, so yeah, but absolutely, it's a good point. Uh, JD asks a question. Uh, um, it's quoting reducing commuter travel to Bath from rural areas. How? Um, how how is it possible to reduce uh, commuters coming into Bath? Um, I mean, better use of the park and rides. Is that what we were referring to? And making the park and rides into hubs so that you can change onto the bus or onto an electric bike. Um, one of the things possible is you could you know, drive into the uh, odd down park and ride and catch a bus to Bristol. You know, so actually we're making we're making we're giving people choices uh, earlier in their or midway through their journeys rather than driving to the city centre is, is to is to change their Sarah, did you want to say something about that? I was, well, I was going to say, of course, well, look, all of us over the last couple of years, many of us have learned about working from home and um, uh, working remotely. Um, and so that's a factor too. And um, another um, strand, I would say, is creating sort of community shared working spaces, perhaps, and community hubs out in the villages that will reduce the need for travel of all sorts. So the more facilities you have available locally, the less you need to leave your village. And certainly one of uh, I mean, uh, this document is very bar focused and uh, one of my plans is to try and get something that's more NES focused to to sit alongside this. And I know Sarah agrees with me. Um, uh, and one of the things that uh, I want to do with the next tranche of money uh, is to map the green lanes uh, in the rural areas, um, because at the moment green lanes tend to be used by uh, uh, motorbikes and uh, four by fours who like to race through uh, mud and water and actually there's a whole network out there that could that links villages uh, and it would be amazing to be able to cycle uh, to, to the other villages by not having whilst not having to go on on some of those country lanes which are very dangerous and we mentioned speeding earlier I and mean, as a rural there's councillor speeding is is one of the biggest issues um it's it's gone seven o'clock, so I'm just gonna I'm just finishing on a question here from JD. If Baines don't achieve net zero by 2030, who is responsible, and what are the consequences? Now that's a very good question, JD. Uh, so I think it was March 2019 when all those councillors sat in the council chamber uh, and agreed to declare a climate emergency. Um, uh, and you know, um, set that aim to reduce our uh, uh, to try and achieve net zero by 2020, uh, 2030. Uh, and you know, we've all taken on that mantle. All the, all those of us who got elected two months later, we've all taken on that challenge. Uh, and I think you've got you know, you've potentially got two more administrations before we get to 2030. Uh, and those people you elect, you can hold them responsible. And I guess the consequences are if, if if you don't like the fact that we haven't achieved it, you can you can vote us out. Um, but uh, Sarah, I don't know if you want to add something more subtle than that. <laughs> well, I, I would add that, um, I mean, as I've indicated, the council doesn't control everything. So it is a collective responsibility. And of course, as um, as uh, an organisation and as a group of councillors, we have to do what we can to create the infrastructure that will support this and to create the leadership um, and, and to, to encourage people and to lead people to, to make that happen. Um, but we cannot achieve everything uh, as a council and as an organisation uh, across the whole of Bath and North East Somerset. And, and when we declared the climate emergency, in fact, that was what we actually stated. We were would um, uh, provide the leadership to ensure that the district would uh, achieve 2030, net zero by 2030. I mean, if we don't achieve it, well, I mean, if as a civilization we don't achieve it, then I think that the consequences will be very serious. As you have um, seen, no doubt, over the last year, the numerous extreme weather events, the wildfires in Oregon and Australia, the um, uh, heat waves in Moscow and um, the northwest of the United States and in Greece um, uh, and so on and so on. You know, the, 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 I mean, the, the catalogue now is is huge and rising. So we, we have to take that seriously. The possibility of simultaneous um, heat waves in all the breadbaskets of the northern hemisphere is one we have to take seriously. 
Thank you, Sarah. And I would like to reassure you that uh, uh, our wonderful officers are all working hard to, to come up with these solutions uh, and uh, test them and come up with the business cases. And some of the ideas we've discussed today will obviously be taken further. Their business cases will be drawn up. There will be consultations uh, before uh, any of these things get put in place. Lots of detail for you to study and get involved with uh, at a future date. Um, uh, I uh, like to thank uh, all our attendees for coming this evening. We will feel, feed the questions. We ended up with 121 questions, uh, and I don't think we got more than 50 done. So th those questions will be fed into the consultation process. Uh, and uh, look forward to hearing your further thoughts. Uh, sorry, I didn't. If you put stuff in and I didn't get to you, thank you to our officers for your contributions, and uh, thank you to the one who cannot be seen, who's been driving this, uh, Mark. Uh, and thank you for your help there. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and see you soon. Thank you, Robert.